Epistemology is the branch of philosophy concerned with the nature and scope of knowledge and is also referred to as theory of knowledge. It questions what knowledge is and how it can be acquired, and the extent to which knowledge pertinent to any given subject or entity can be acquired. Much of the debate in this field has focused on the philosophical analysis of the nature of knowledge and how it relates to connected notions such as truth, belief, and justification. The term epistemology was introduced by the Scottish philosopher James Frederick Ferrier. Background and meaning Epistemology is a neologism derived from the Greek epistema meaning knowledge, and logos meaning study of. It translates the German concept Wissens Schaftslu, which was used by Fichte and Bolzano for different projects before it was taken up again by Husserl. J. F. Ferrier coined the word on the model of ontology. To designate the branch of philosophy a euro firmed to be the latter's true beginning a euro to discover the meaning of knowledge. The term passed into French as a copyright pist a copyright homology, with, however, a generally narrower meaning than the original, the import of which is covered by theory of knowledge, tha copyright a reader la connaissance. Thus a permil mile Meursen opened his identity and reality, written in 1908. With the remark that the word is becoming current as equivalent to the philosophy of the sciences, philosophy des sciences. Knowledge, knowledge that, knowledge how, and knowledge by acquaintance. In epistemology in general, the kind of knowledge usually discussed is propositional knowledge, also known as knowledge that. This is distinguished from knowledge how, and acquaintance knowledge. For example, in mathematics, it is known that 2 plus 2 equals 4. But there is also knowing how to add two numbers and knowing a person, place, thing, or activity. Some philosophers think there is an important distinction between knowing that, knowing how, and acquaintance knowledge, with epistemology being primarily concerned with the first of these. In his paper on denoting and his later book Problems of Philosophy, Bertrand Russell stressed the distinction between knowledge by description and knowledge by acquaintance. Gilbert Ryle is also credited with stressing the distinction between knowing how and knowing that in the concept of mind. In Personal Knowledge, Michael Polony argues for the epistemological relevance of knowledge how and knowledge that. Using the example of the act of balance involved in riding a bicycle, he suggests that the theoretical knowledge of the physics involved in maintaining a state of balance cannot substitute for the practical knowledge of how to ride and that it is important to understand how both are established and grounded. This position is essentially Ryles, who argued that a failure to acknowledge the distinction between knowledge that and knowledge how leads to infinite regress. In recent times, some epistemologists and Duncan Pritchard have argued that epistemology should evaluate people's properties, and not just the properties of propositions or of propositional mental attitudes. Belief In common speech, a statement of belief is typically an expression of faith and or trust in a person, power or other entity a euro a paradigmatic example of such a statement of belief would be a declaration or affirmation of religious faith. While it addresses belief of this kind, epistemology is also concerned with belief in a very much broader sense of the word. In this broader sense belief simply means the acceptance as true of any cognitive content. To believe is to accept as true. Truth. Whether someone's belief is true is not a prerequisite for belief. On the other hand, if something is actually known, then it categorically cannot be false. For example, if a person believes that a bridge is safe enough to support him, and attempts to cross it, but the bridge then collapses under his weight, it could be said that he believed that the bridge was safe but that his belief was mistaken. It would not be accurate to say that he knew that the bridge was safe, because plainly it was not. By contrast, if the bridge actually supported his weight, then he might say that he had believed that the bridge was safe, whereas now, after proving it to himself, he knows it to be safe. Epistemologists argue over whether belief is the proper truth-bearer. Some would rather describe knowledge as a system of justified true propositions, and others as a system of justified true sentences. Plato, in his Gorgias, argues that belief is the most commonly invoked truth-bearer. Justification, in many of Plato's dialogues, such as the Meno and, in particular, the Theanetitus, Socrates considers a number of theories as to what knowledge is, the last being that knowledge is true belief that has been given an account of. 
according to the theory that knowledge is justified true belief, in order to know that a given proposition is true, one must not only believe the relevant true proposition, but one must also have a good reason for doing so. One implication of this would be that no one would gain knowledge just by believing something that happened to be true. For example, an ill person with no medical training, but with a generally optimistic attitude, might believe that he will recover from his illness quickly. Nevertheless, even if this belief turned out to be true, the patient would not have known that he would get well since his belief lacked justification. The definition of knowledge as justified true belief was widely accepted until the 1960s. At this time, a paper written by the American philosopher Edmund Gettier provoked major widespread discussion. The Gettier Problem Edmund Gettier is best known for a short paper entitled Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? published in 1963, which called into question the theory of knowledge that had been dominant among philosophers for thousands of years. In a few pages, Gettier argued that there are situations in which one's belief may be justified and true, yet fail to count as knowledge. That is, Gettier contended that while justified belief in a true proposition is necessary for that proposition to be known, it is not sufficient. As in the diagram, a true proposition can be believed by an individual but still not fall within the knowledge category. According to Gettier, there are certain circumstances in which one does not have knowledge, even when all of the above conditions are met. Gettier proposed two thought experiments, which have come to be known as Gettier cases, as counterexamples to the classical account of knowledge. One of the cases involves two men, Smith and Jones, who were awaiting the results of their applications for the same job. Each man has ten coins in his pocket. Smith has excellent reasons to believe that Jones will get the job and, furthermore, knows that Jones has ten coins in his pocket. From this Smith infers, the man who will get the job has ten coins in his pocket. However, Smith is unaware that he also has ten coins in his own pocket. Furthermore, Smith, not Jones, is going to get the job. While Smith has strong evidence to believe that Jones will get the job, he is wrong. Smith has a justified true belief that a man with ten coins in his pocket will get the job. However, according to Gettier, Smith does not know that a man with ten coins in his pocket will get the job, because Smith's belief is true by virtue of the number of coins in Jones's pocket, while Smith does not know how many coins are in Smith's pocket, and bases his belief on account of the coins in Jones's pocket, whom he falsely believes to be the man who will get the job. These cases fail to be knowledge because the subject's belief is justified, but only happens to be true by virtue of luck. In other words, he made the correct choice for the wrong reasons. This example is similar to those often given when discussing belief and truth, wherein a person's belief of what will happen can coincidentally be correct without his or her having the actual knowledge to base it on. Responses to Gettier The responses to Gettier have been varied. Usually, they have involved substantial attempts to provide a definition of knowledge different from the classical one either by recasting knowledge as justified true belief with some additional fourth condition, or as something else altogether. Infallibilism, indefeasibility, in one response to Gettier, the American philosopher Richard Kirkham has argued that the only definition of knowledge that could ever be immune to all counterexamples is the infallibilist one. To qualify as an item of knowledge, goes the theory, a belief must not only be true and justified, the justification of the belief must necessitate its truth. In other words, the justification for the belief must be infallible. Yet another possible candidate for the fourth condition of knowledge is indefeasibility. Defeasibility theory maintains that there should be no overriding or defeating truths for the reasons that justify one's belief. For example, Suppose that person S believes he saw Tom Gribbett steal a book from the library and uses this to justify the claim that Tom Gribbett stole a book from the library. A possible defeater or overriding proposition for such a claim could be a true proposition like, Tom Gribbett's identical twin Sam is currently in the same town as Tom. When no defeaters of one's justification exist, a subject would be epistemically justified. The Indian philosopher B. K. Matalal has drawn on the Navya Nayaya for liberalism tradition to respond to the Gettier problem. 
Nyala theory distinguishes between no P and no that one knows P a euro these are different events, with different causal conditions. The second level is a sort of implicit inference that usually follows immediately the episode of knowing P. The Gettier case is examined by referring to a view of Ganesha Upadhyaya, who takes any true belief to be knowledge. Thus a true belief acquired through a wrong route may just be regarded as knowledge simplis sita on this view. The question of justification arises only at the second level, when one considers the knowledgehood of the acquired belief. Initially, there is lack of uncertainty, so it becomes a true belief. But at the very next moment, when the hearer is about to embark upon the venture of knowing whether he knows P, doubts may arise. If, in some Gettier-like cases, I am wrong in my inference about the knowledge who do the given a current belief, then I am mistaken about the truth of my belief a euro, and this is in accordance with Nyaphilibalism, not all knowledge claims can be sustained. Reliabilism Reliabilism has been a significant line of response to the Gettier problem among philosophers, originating with work by Alvin Goldman in the 1960s. According to reliabilism, a belief is justified only if it is produced by processes that typically yield a sufficiently high ratio of true to false beliefs. In other words, this theory states that a true belief counts as knowledge only if it is produced by a reliable belief-forming process. Reliabilism has been challenged by Gettier cases. Another argument that challenges reliabilism, like the Gettier cases, is the case of Henry and the Barn for Section Adders. In the thought experiment, a man, Henry, is driving along and sees a number of buildings that resemble barns. Based on his perception of one of these, he concludes that he has just seen barns. While he has seen one, and the perception he based his belief that the one he saw was of a real barn, all the other barn-like buildings he saw were four-section adders. Theoretically, Henry does not know that he has seen a barn, despite both his belief that he has seen one being true and his belief being formed on the basis of a reliable process, since he only acquired his true belief by accident. Other responses, Robert Nozick has offered the following definition of knowledge, S knows that P if and only if, P. S believes that P. If P were false, S would not believe that P. If P is true, S will believe that P. Nozick argues that the third of these conditions serves to address cases of the sort described by Gettier. Nozick further claims this condition addresses a case of the sort described by D. M. Armstrong, a father believes his daughter innocent of committing a particular crime, both because of faith in his baby girl and because he has seen presented in the courtroom a conclusive demonstration of his daughter's innocence. His belief via the method of the courtroom satisfies the four subjunctive conditions, but his faith-based belief does not. If his daughter were guilty, he would still believe her innocent, on the basis of faith in his daughter. This would violate the third condition. The British philosopher Simon Blackburn has criticized this formulation by suggesting that we do not want to accept his knowledge beliefs, which, while they track the truth, are not held for appropriate reasons. He says that we do not want to award the title of knowing something to someone who is only meeting the conditions through a defect, flaw, or failure, compared with someone else who is not meeting the conditions. In addition to this, externalist accounts of knowledge, such as Nozick's, are often forced to reject closure in cases where it is intuitively valid. Timothy Williamson has advanced a theory of knowledge according to which knowledge is not justified true belief plus some extra condition, s. In his book Knowledge and Its Limits, Williamson argues that the concept of knowledge cannot be broken down into a set of other concepts through analysis a euro instead, it is sui generis. Thus, though knowledge requires justification, truth, and belief, the word knowledge can't be, according to Williamson's theory, accurately regarded as simply shorthand for justified true belief. Alvin Goldman writes in his Causal Theory of Knowing that in order for knowledge to truly exist there must be a causal chain between the proposition and the belief of that proposition. Externalism and Internalism Part of the debate over the nature of knowledge is a debate between epistemological externalists on the one hand, and epistemological internalists on the other. Externalists hold that factors deemed external, meaning outside of the psychological states of those who gain knowledge, can be conditions of knowledge. For example, 
An externalist response to the Gettier problem is to say that, in order for a justified true belief to count as knowledge, there must be a link or dependency between the belief and the state of the external world. Usually this is understood to be a causal link. Such causation, to the extent that it is outside the mind, would count as an external, knowledge-yielding condition. Internalists, on the other hand, assert that all knowledge-yielding conditions are within the psychological states of those who gain knowledge. Though unfamiliar with the internalist-externalist debate himself, many point to Rena Copyright Descartes as an early example of the internalist path to justification. He wrote that, because the only method by which we perceive the external world is through our senses, and that, because the senses are not infallible, we should not consider our concept of knowledge to be infallible. The only way to find anything that could be described as indubitably true, he advocates, would be to see things clearly and distinctly. He argued that if there is an omnipotent, good being who made the world, then it's reasonable to believe that people are made with the ability to know. However, this does not mean that man's ability to know is perfect. God gave man the ability to know, but not omniscience. Descartes said that man must use his capacities for knowledge correctly and carefully through methodological doubt. The dictum cogito ergo sum is also commonly associated with Descartes' theory, because in his own methodological doubt, doubting everything he previously knew in order to start from a blank slate, the first thing that he could not logically bring himself to doubt was his own existence, I do not exist would be a contradiction in terms. The act of saying that one does not exist assumes that someone must be making the statement in the first place. Though Descartes could doubt his senses, his body and the world around him, he could not deny his own existence, because he was able to doubt and must exist in order to do so. Even if some evil genius were to be deceiving him, he would have to exist in order to be deceived. This one short point provided him with what he would call his Archimedean point, in order to further develop his foundation for knowledge. Simply put, Descartes' epistemological justification depended upon his indubitable belief in his own existence and his clear and distinct knowledge of God. The value problem, a formulation of the value problem in epistemology first occurs in Plato's Meno. The problem is to identify what is it about knowledge that makes it more valuable than mere true belief, or that makes knowledge more valuable than a more minimal conjunction of its components on a particular analysis of knowledge. The value problem re-emerged in the philosophical literature on epistemology in the 21st century following the rise of virtue epistemology in the 1980s, partly because of the obvious link with the concept of value in ethics. The value problem has been presented as an argument against epistemic reliabilism by philosophers including Linda Zorgzebski, Wayne Riggs and Richard Swinburne. Zorgzebski gives a thought experiment to illustrate the unimportance of the belief being produced by a reliable process, imagine you go to a coffee machine and attempt to have it produce you a cup of coffee. The machine you use might reliably produce coffee, or it might not. Imagine one machine had a 90% chance of producing you coffee while another only had a 40% chance. If you happen to choose the 40% chance machine and it produces you a cup of coffee, the fact that it does not reliably produce coffee does not change the value that the coffee has to you. Similarly, if you have a true belief achieved through an unreliable process, Zorgzebski argues that there's no particular reason that has less value than one produced through a reliable process. Advocates of virtue epistemology have argued that the value of knowledge comes from an internal relationship between the knower and the mental state of believing. One of the more influential responses to the problem is that knowledge is not particularly valuable and is not what ought to be the main focus of epistemology. Instead, epistemologists ought to focus on other mental states, such as understanding. Acquiring knowledge, the second question that will be dealt with is the question of how knowledge is acquired. This area of epistemology covers, issues concerning epistemic distinctions such as that between empirical and non-empirical methods of formulating knowledge. Distinguish between synthesis and analysis used as means of proof, debate such as the one between empiricists and rationalists. What is called the regress problem, a priori and a posteriori knowledge. The nature of this distinction has been disputed by various philosophers. However, the terms may be roughly defined as follows, 
a priori knowledge is knowledge that is known independently of experience. It will henceforth be acquired through anything that is independent from experience. A posteriori knowledge is knowledge that is known by experience. Evolutionary psychology takes a novel approach to the problem. It says that there is an innate predisposition for certain types of learning. Only small parts of the brain resemble a tabula rasa. This is true even for human beings. The remainder is more like an exposed negative waiting to be dipped into a developer fluid, analytical eurosynthetic distinction. Immanuel Kant, in his critique of pure reason, drew a distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions. He contended that some propositions are such that we can know them to be true just by understanding their meaning. For example, Consider, my father's brother is my uncle. We can know it to be true solely by virtue of our understanding what its terms mean. Philosophers call such propositions analytic. Synthetic propositions, on the other hand, have distinct subjects and predicates. An example of a synthetic proposition would be, my father's brother has black hair. Kant stated that all mathematical and scientific statements are synthetic a priori propositions because they are necessarily true but our knowledge about the attributes of the mathematical or physical subjects we can only get by logical inference. The American philosopher W. V. O'Quine, in his Two Dogmas of Empiricism, famously challenged the distinction, arguing that the two have a blurry boundary. Some contemporary philosophers have offered more sustainable accounts of the distinction. Branches or tendencies within epistemology, historical, the historical study of philosophical epistemology is the historical study of efforts to gain philosophical understanding or knowledge of the nature and scope of human knowledge. Since efforts to get that kind of understanding have a history, the questions philosophical epistemology asks today about human knowledge are not necessarily the same as they once were. But that does not mean that philosophical epistemology is itself a historical subject or that it pursues only or even primarily historical understanding. Empiricism, in philosophy, empiricism is generally a theory of knowledge focusing on the role of experience, especially experience based on perceptual observations by the senses. Certain forms treat all knowledge as empirical, while some regard disciplines such as mathematics and logic as exceptions. There are many variants of empiricism, Positivism and realism being among the most commonly expanded but central to all empiricist epistemologies is the notion of the epistemologically privileged status of sense data. Idealism Many idealists believe that knowledge is primarily acquired by a priori processes or is innate a euro, for example, in the form of concepts not derived from experience. The relevant theoretical processes often go by the name intuition. The relevant theoretical concepts may purportedly be part of the structure of the human mind, or they may be said to exist independently of the mind. Rationalism By contrast with empiricism and idealism, which centers around the epistemologically privileged status of sense data and the primacy of reason respectively, modern rationalism adds a third system of thinking, and holds that all three are of equal importance, the empirical, the theoretical and the abstract. For Bachelard, rationalism makes equal reference to all three systems of thinking. An example of abstract thinking is Pythagoras' concept of pure geometric forms, perfect triangles, squares, circles, etc. Another example is imaginary numbers, in mathematics. Constructivism Constructivism is a view in philosophy according to which all knowledge is a compilation of human-made constructions not the neutral discovery of an objective truth. Whereas objectivism is concerned with the object of our knowledge, constructivism emphasizes how we construct knowledge. Constructivism proposes new definitions for knowledge and truth that form a new paradigm, based on intersubjectivity instead of the classical objectivity, and on viability instead of truth. Piagetian constructivism, however, believes in objective idea euro constructs can be validated through experimentation. The constructivist point of view is pragmatic. As Vico said, the norm of the truth is to have made it. The regress problem. To justify a belief one must appeal to a further justified belief. This means that one of two things can be the case. Either there are some, 
epistemologically basic beliefs that we can be justified for holding, without being able to justify them on the basis of any other belief, or else for each justified belief there is an infinite regress of justification, the nebula theory. On this theory there is no rock bottom of justification. Justification just meanders in and out through our network of beliefs, stopping nowhere. The apparent impossibility of completing an infinite chain of reasoning is thought by some to support skepticism. Socrates said, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. Response to the regress problem, many epistemologists studying justification have attempted to argue for various types of chains of reasoning that can escape the regress problem. Infinitism, it is not impossible for an infinite justificatory series to exist. This position is known as infinitism. Infinitists typically take the infinite series to be merely potential, in the sense that an individual may have indefinitely many reasons available to him, without having consciously thought through all of these reasons when the need arises. This position is motivated in part by the desire to avoid what is seen as the arbitrariness and circularity of its chief competitors, foundationalism and coherentism. In mathematics, an infinite series will sometimes converge a euro a euro one can therefore have an infinite series of logical arguments and analyze it for a convergent solution. Foundationalism Foundationalists respond to the regress problem by asserting that certain foundations, or basic beliefs support other beliefs but do not themselves require justification from other beliefs. These beliefs might be justified because they are self-evident, infallible, or derive from reliable cognitive mechanisms. Perception, memory, and a priori intuition are often considered to be possible examples of basic beliefs. The chief criticism of foundationalism is that if a belief is not supported by other beliefs, accepting it may be arbitrary or unjustified, though foundationalism is based upon the principle that these beliefs are infallible enough to be recognized as such in practice. Coherentism, another response to the regress problem is coherentism, which is the rejection of the assumption that the regress proceeds according to a pattern of linear justification. To avoid the charge of circularity, coherentists hold that an individual belief is justified circularly by the way it fits together with the rest of the belief system of which it is a part. This theory has the advantage of avoiding the infinite regress without claiming special, possibly arbitrary status for some particular class of beliefs. Yet, since a system can be coherent while also being wrong, coherentists face the difficulty of ensuring that the whole system corresponds to reality. Additionally, most logicians agree that any argument that is circular is trivially valid. That is, to be illuminating, arguments must be linear with conclusions that follow from stated premises. However, while Burton writes in thinking from A to Z, circular arguments are not invalid. In other words, from a logical point of view there is nothing intrinsically wrong with them. However, they are, when viciously circular, spectacularly uninformative. While Burton 1996 found he rentism, a position known as found he rentism, advanced by Susan Hoek, is meant to be a unification of foundationalism and coherentism. One component of this theory is what is called the analogy of the crossword puzzle. Whereas, for example, infinitists regard the regress of reasons as shaped like a single line, Susan Hook has argued that it is more like a crossword puzzle, with multiple lines mutually supporting each other. What do people know? The last question that will be dealt with is the question of what people know. At the heart of this area of study is skepticism with many approaches involved trying to disprove some particular form of it. Skepticism Skepticism is related to the question of whether a certain knowledge is possible. If point B cannot be proven before point A, and if in order to prove point A it must be established with absolute certainty, then skepticism argues that it is difficult to prove any point at all. Skeptics argue that the belief in something does not necessarily justify an assertion of knowledge of it. In this skeptics oppose foundationalism, which states that there have to be some basic beliefs that are justified without reference to others. The skeptical response to this can take several approaches. First, claiming that basic beliefs must exist, amounts to the logical fallacy of argument from ignorance combined with the slippery slope. 
while a foundationalist would use Ma Wan Court and Charles and Trilemma as a justification for demanding the validity of basic beliefs, a skeptic would see no problem with admitting the result. Developments from skepticism, early in the 20th century, the notion that belief had to be justified as such to count as knowledge lost favor. Fallibilism is the view that knowing something does not entail certainty regarding it. Charles Sanders Park was a fallibilist and the most developed form of fallibilism can be traced to Karl Popper whose first book Logic der Chung, 1934 introduced a conjectural turn into the philosophy of science and epistemology at large. He adumbrated a school of thought that is known as critical rationalism with a central tenet being the rejection of the idea that knowledge can ever be justified in the strong form that is sought by most schools of thought. His two most helpful exponents are the late William W. Bartley and David Miller, recently retired from the University of Warwick. A major source of online material is the Critical Rationalist website and also the Rat House of Rafe Champion. Epistemic Culture Epistemic culture distinguishes between various settings of knowledge production and stresses their contextual aspects. Coined by Karen Nosetina in her book Epistemic Cultures. She defines epistemic cultures as an amalgam of arrangements and mechanisms a euro bonded through affinity, necessity and historical coincidence euro, which in a given field, make up how we know what we know. The term provides the conceptual framework used to demonstrate that different laboratories do not share the same scientific knowledge production model, but rather each is endowed with a different epistemic culture prescribing what is adequate knowledge and how it is obtained. Since its introduction, the term has been picked up and used by various researchers engaging in science and technology studies. Practical applications, far from being purely academic, the study of epistemology is useful for a great many applications. It is particularly commonly employed in issues of law where proof of guilt or innocence may be required, or when it must be determined whether a person knew a particular fact before taking a specific action. Another practical application is to the design of user interfaces. For example, the skills, rules, and knowledge taxonomy of human behavior has been used by designers to develop systems that are compatible with multiple ways of knowing abstract analytic reasoning, experience-based gut feelings, and craft sensorimotor skills. Other common applications of epistemology include. See also. For a topical guide to this subject, see Outline of Epistemology. Footnotes. Works cited. Further reading. The London Philosophy Study Guide offers many suggestions on what to read, depending on the student's familiarity with the subject, epistemology and methodology, external links, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy articles, epistemology by Matthias Stupp, Bayesian epistemology by William Talbot, evolutionary epistemology by Michael Brady and William Harms, feminist epistemology and philosophy of science by Elizabeth Anderson. Naturalized Epistemology by Richard Feldman. Social Epistemology by Alvin Goldman. Virtue Epistemology by John Greco. Other links, Epistemology at Phil Papers, Epistemology at the Indiana Philosophy Ontology Project, Epistemology Entry in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, What is Epistemology? A Euro A Brief Introduction to the Topic by Keith DeRose. Certain Doubts a Euro a group blog run by Jonathan Kvanvig, with many leading epistemologists as contributors. The Epistemological Lifeboat by Berger Jarland and Jeb Nicolaisen, The Epistemology Page by Keith DeRose. Justified True Belief and Critical Rationalism by Matthew Toll, The White Book by Tinky Brass. Epistemology Papers A Collection of Michael Hymers. Epistemology Introduction Part 1 and Part 2 by Paul Nawal at the Galilean Library. Teaching Theory of Knowledge A Euro Marjorie Clay, an electronic publication from the Council for Philosophical Studies. Epistemology, The Philosophy of Knowledge A Euro An Introduction at Grubhavi Web. The Peripatetic A Euro A Practical Introduction to the Theory of Knowledge, Theory of Knowledge A Euro An Introduction to Epistemology, Exploring the Various Theories of Knowledge, Justification, and Belief. A Theory of Knowledge by Clack Cubed Bisharis Kamerik, on the Social Science Research Network, 2006. An Introduction to Epistemology by Paul Nawal, 
aimed at beginners. On a critical epistemology, language perception and action, philosophical issues, a short film about epistemology, for beginners.